Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello, and welcome to the show. Today is the first Human Origin Project podcast, and Steph and I use this opportunity to explain to you how our own journey and thinking has come to really exploring the true story of humanity's past. We talk about great thinkers in humanity's past and the knowledge that we use today as potentially an appropriation of our very clever ancestors and where this all came from. And if we misunderstand the context of where knowledge comes from, it becomes very confusing. We don't know how to apply it. So that becomes a a very interesting mix of the scientific and the philosophical, which really the Human Origin Project is about. We are all about discussing the evidence of, you know, where things came from. But then we have to dive into the why. The why is very important, and that's something that uh, modern science isn't so good at explaining. And so the purpose of today's show is to give you a little bit of an introduction to the way we think and also how the platform operates and to really encourage the people out there that are interested in these topics to participate, uh, ask questions and submit your own work to the Human Origin Project. So I hope you enjoy today's uh, first podcast episode of the Human Origin Project. Hello and welcome to the Human Origin Project. This is our first podcast and I'm Stephen, I'm here with Stefan and today we're going to talk a bit about about the Human Origin Project, where it comes from, uh, how we began talking about it and a lot of the different lines of evidence that brought us to, to begin to work on a platform that helps bring forth the conversation of where humanity came from and about our past in general on planet Earth. Steph? It's exciting to be doing our first podcast. Yeah, it's exciting to uh, to finally be behind the mic. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been so exciting to to start and to get this all going and to finally have a tangible place to bring all our ideas together. And I mean, we've been talking about this for years and been interested in it. And it's really nice to have a space to be able to, you know, throw everything that we've learned and have other people um, come in and talk about what they know and you know really open the, this conversation not only to uh, ourselves but to the to the world like there's such a worldwide community of people interested in this yeah that's what we really found isn't it that the internet helps you to be able to connect to people thinking in the same kind of wavelength and we really kind of just started talking about this in terms of like what we were interested in right and we'll talk a little bit about that today but it's funny how concepts and how when you're especially when communities come together there is usually a sole purpose and everyone's kind of just curious in this whole area and that's more or less you know how we started talking about this stuff is that we're both just kind of curious people that kind of ask questions and that really kind of, and also we're both skeptical by nature as well so we dig into you know is that real or is that you know set in any kind of uh you know scientific evidence or um, tangible things that we can cross into and it, it just becomes this whole um, this whole conversation doesn't it that really does take a new life yeah definitely and I, I remember the first time that it really resonated with me um, it was about three years ago maybe I went to Stonehenge and um, it was just I'd never really thought about ancient history you know it was always just reading about pyramids in textbooks and that sort of thing but being at Stonehenge and seeing these stones are just kind of like I had this kind of like wow moment just how did they do that? Why did they do that? What is going on? Like millions of people flocking to these stones every year. Why? Like what? And then you start looking at the people that that were involved in building it. We don't even know who they were. We don't know how they did it. And all these question marks started appearing. And then it just it's just like this endless path of trying to understand what exactly, why it was so important to, to build these sites and, and why they're so revered today. Like there's something still about them that draws us in and is it's just curiosity it's yeah completely and i remember that trip we took there because we were just looking at all these kind of lines of discussion about you know what the, the ancients were doing you know what 
we really know about ancient history. And when you go to Stonehenge with the idea that you're going to learn more, you really come away with more questions than answers, don't you? I mean, the answers you do see is that, wow, they knew a lot. Um, and that really kind of fills you when you go to the sites and experience what they put together. What really kind of, I remember when I was there, um, you know, looking at the structures, looking at the, and understanding, for instance, when you look at what people have written about the, uh, why they were put together, you know, the understanding of, for instance, the solstices and the equinoxes and a knowledge of astronomical uh, bodies and movements that really we don't understand very well today or we don't record or appreciate today and it just led me to more questions and I was just thinking why would they do that and then it leads you to the question how like how on earth did they do this these huge stone blocks like when you see them it's it's just you can't put it into a modern day context and I know you know they've put modern day you know uh, reproductions of how the stone were put together and built but to me I look at that and it doesn't make sense um, so there was always more questions after we visited the site yeah definitely and I think I think from that and I, I started trying to look into you know who the, these people were and why they did this and what what was going on back in ancient times um, and I remember coming across Hamlet's Mill a book that was written I think in the 50s maybe or the 60s um, that sort of takes this idea that all these stories that we have it, it focuses on Shakespeare and the story of Hamlet and how all these stories uh, at the basis of them is astronomical knowledge but a way of, of um, bringing that forward to through throughout history and through time is by telling stories and um, using that as a way of encoding this really profound astronomical knowledge which is similar with Stonehenge it's all astronomically aligned it's all to do with the heavens and the stars and there was something going on where that was at the highest point for them. That was that was one of the most important things. Yeah, that was a concept I remember we were talking about early and Hamlet's Mill kind of came up as a book and this idea that, yeah, these stories encoded this information that, which is why it resonated so much with people. You know, Shakespeare, you know, prolific playwright um, and writer, but the reason why his concepts were so... Um, revered was because they had these these concepts in them and then you see them also linked into ancient sites and buildings and all of a sudden you're starting to see this um, b body of knowledge that we don't really understand today you know there's no explanation of why Shakespeare is so important you know we kind of break it down in very you know if you think about your seventh grade English class and breaking down Shakespeare you don't talk about the astronomical knowledge of it do you but there's that really kind of started the conversations like, well, do we really know this? And then you just kind of keep going down, the, you know, trying to find sources as to where these people got this information from. Yeah, and I think until you, you understand where it's come from, uh, until you've got that context, it's hard to build an understanding of what it's talking about. I mean, you can understand the story, but if you don't know its origins and what it's really trying to convey, it's kind of you're missing half the picture, which I find is the, 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 the more you look into these old old sort of ancient mysteries um, the more you find that there's a lot of this information that you go the further back you go the more that you find there is kind of hidden and that's sort of blurred through time yeah that point of understanding context is so important one thing that really I kind of found that affected my career um, I'm a dentist in and as with a healthcare background I dealt with a lot of diseases and conditions that we deal with today in society we consider normal tooth decay crooked teeth and putting braces on kids and what really was a breakthrough moment for me was when i saw anthropological texts and studies that looked at the history of dental disease and jaws and teeth as the marking point of humanity that's what anthropology is built on jaws and teeth because it's the most stable and most calcium rich um anthropological records that we have and so that was never taught to me in dental school and so I was brought into the world of a dentist named Weston A. Price who wrote a book in the 30s that showed hey people that don't eat uh, traditional foods as soon as they eat the modern diet they get dental disease including tooth decay at their modern rates but also crooked teeth and crooked teeth was a real kind of mind-opening one of those moments where I was like whoa what 
you know, if if you think about what we're told about orthodontic braces is that kids are just destined to get um, crooked teeth and they need braces put on their teeth to fix it. And I, that's what I was taught in dental school. Basically, we could you can identify and fix crooked teeth. But then there was a whole body of knowledge out there that showed the crooked teeth didn't happen. And it's the same concept as wisdom teeth impactions where the jaw doesn't grow. And then you have to take out the wisdom teeth at you know, roughly uh, the age of 20. But when the jaw doesn't grow, the teeth don't fit. And, and once you kind of flip your mind to that, all of a sudden the whole thing changes. And then there's this whole body of scientific knowledge out there under showing us that craniofacial growth and breathing and so for instance the teeth that sit in the maxilla bone all has an effect or a, um, a consequence when the, the jaws don't grow properly so you, when you don't breathe right you have sleep apnea when you, and so we're in a constant we're in a breathing epidemic now and you can prevent these things in kids by fixing their breathing fixing their oral function fixing the nutrients in their body to help them grow bones and it was one of the biggest health problems on the planet that i really hadn't seen that way and it took me a long time to understand it but it was the context that flipped it as soon as that was flipped in my mind i was looking at it differently and that's why it's so important you know you can be doing things completely wrong and not understand it unless you have that that anchoring point from where we came from yeah i think that's such a good analogy as well with crooked teeth putting braces on compared to understanding the the function that caused that in the first place and relating that back to you know, these, these ancient cultures and these ancient practices and this ancient knowledge, until you understand the context of where that comes from and, and how we know what we know. Until we understand that, we're not going to know. It's going to be hard to understand it in a, in a modern day because it's, it's a similar thing. We've got these kind of like band-aid bits of information and snippets of knowledge here and there, but we, we don't understand the big picture and where it's all kind of come from and originated from. Completely. And I remember reading Price's book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And he went around the world into these cultures and he looked at what the modern diet was made up of. And what he found was that they revered the, the foods that would create a round head in a baby. And they would say, this, eat these foods six months before conception, you, you have a child with a round head. That's as simple as it is. But the thing is, a kid with a round head has a better developed jaw and base of the craniosacral system and better airway. And so now I've got a, um, a seven-month-year-old and when He's got you, a round head? <laughs> little bobble head. Um, but he, when you understand those principles and you see his craniofacial development, this is what we do in the, the practice now as well, is that we pick up these problems um, at the start. You can un untie these growth problems that then will... Um, enable him to grow a jaw that fits 32 teeth when he's 12 and, and um, older. And so once you untie those issues, and but the thing is, I discounted it as, a, as this very kind of like basic knowledge. It's like, oh, you eat the foods and you get the round head. But there's all this whole other health um, layers to it. So you don't get chronic disease, you don't get sleep issues, you don't get uh, immune issues because your teeth are strong, your immune system is strong, fat soluble vitamins relate to calcium balance but also the immune system. And then we talk about the gut and, and when you don't have bacterial imbalances in the mouth, you don't have bacterial imbalances in the gut. We know that's all connected to uh, every chronic disease now through scientific evidence. We've only really discovered this in the last 10 years. So they were talking about a much deeper set of principles and I took it at a very superficial level then but when you go deeper, you understand they understand things far, far more than what we did. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the really interesting things about working on HOP and working on with this community is that there is this body of knowledge out there that is so fundamental to our existence, you know, and, and that there are these kind of little snippets that keep appearing in modern times. And now that we have this scientific lens to look um, into ancient cultures and into ancient practices, there's a lot of instances where we are, there's proof that you know ancient practices like meditation or like sun gazing or these things that have been talked about for thousands of years, um, there is actually a scientific basis to them, and that I, I think it's such an exciting time to be looking into these things because there's there's so much to learn from our past, and uh, you can't really dismiss these things as you know ceremonial or 
sacrificial or you know things that have no merit because now that they're that the science is coming out on them it's really it's really important to to understand why we've been doing that for thousands of years and why it's that's beneficial for us as as people on this planet yeah completely that marrying of science and ancient legacy the losing the idea that ancient people were primitive i think is a very important point because once you lose that idea your mind completely opens to a world that really goes far beyond what we know today and the great thing about we've really had a scientific revolution over the last few decades you know, in terms of how we apply technology to data to um, understanding you know the, the the inner workings of dna and the microbiology of the body but we've got the tools now that explain it to us in our modern context to understand what they were talking about and so what we're kind of building is just this huge body of knowledge and it's all just learning really in the end um what Uh, yeah well i mean what what i was going to say is that the um that there was going back to stonehenge as well and um you know when you talk about those equinoxes and there's a lot of people that have written about this stuff hasn't there and yeah yeah there 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 are and i think that's been a really interesting thing about working with the human origin project is that until now you know you do your own research and there's there's really amazing people doing studies and there's they're collecting evidence and they're they've but there's no real platform for all these ideas to come together which is i've found really exciting because i read these kind of really obscure studies and obscure books and it's like well what what do you do with that like you've okay you know that now and um and then you move on and learn something else and i feel like it's it's been really important to start drawing all that together and building a story and building a, a coherent sort of narrative that brings in everything. And it's it's cross disciplinary. You know, we've, we're focusing on you know ancient ancient practices, but then modern science and kind of it's kind of a balance between what we can study today and what we know and what people knew in the past and what they've been talking about. And how that can relate to us and kind of like yeah it's just a really nice community that we've we've got ourselves going here completely uh, and one thing about modern scientific research is that a lot of um people will say about certain concepts oh there's no published research on that it's like well for there to be published research someone a researcher has to understand fully the all of the factors that are affecting uh this put a disease um let's say let's talk about crude teeth so some people would have argued that nutrition there's no published research to say uh there's no um there's a link between diet and crooked teeth it's like well yes that's true but do we know a connection between vitamin d deficiency and calcium homeostasis and yes we do we know conditions such as rickets so kids will develop uh bent limbs and this happened this is where the vitamin, discovery of vitamin d deficiency happened uh, during the industrial revolution is when kids were deficient in vitamin d and they had these bowed legs because their body wasn't metabolizing calcium so we figured out you give them cod liver oil and they you you recover the vitamin d but the craniofacial system also uses calcium homeostasis yet we don't link any vitamin d to growth of the craniofacial bones and we know that mothers vitamin d deficiency links to a newborn baby's vitamin d deficiency we know we're in an epidemic of vitamin d deficiency that's just kind of the surface of none of that has been studied in public research because we don't understand the link between craniofacial growth and nutrients so forth so and that's again looking at the big pic like not instead of isolating you know teeth and talking about teeth you're looking at the whole the the way the, the jaw develops and the brain develops within the body and the connection to the gut and the connection to your mother in the womb and what she eats and what the like it's just it builds this huge picture that you need to I guess you would know more than I do but you need to understand the big picture to understand the fine details of it that was completely it and like that was my process in going through and understanding that and that really taught me to look at things with a broader lens and once you kind of take in all of that information so you you take disciplines from the ear nose and throat you take the anthropology, anthropology, anthropological data. You take the uh, nutrition data. You take the um, what what the biochemistry, and then you take all of these things and you 
put put it, you read it and you think about it and you understand and then you can see when people eat the wrong things, how that happens in terms of craniofacial growth. So miss like when we don't understand those contexts and when we don't understand those concepts, we get stuck in systems that are wrong. And I, I, when you go back to Stonehenge, you kind of look at something that we potentially don't understand. That, well, it, can we somehow pin that back? And there is books writing about, for instance, the Greeks and then and how they talked about astronomical alignments. And so, for instance, there's a guy, John Michelle, isn't there, that wrote a lot about that in, in terms of the knowledge encoded into Stonehenge. Yeah, he was just a really curious guy um, who wrote a lot about especially the English landscapes and how um, Stonehenge was one example of a series of megalithic sites that sort of spanned almost the whole of the UK from standing stones to um, stone circles, um, you know, underground chambers, burial mounds, all of these things. It was part of like a huge... um, network of ancient sites and he 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 was just really curious you know he documented them all he measured them he found that there were links between the size of the stones in ireland and the size of the stones in the uk and that they all kind of matched in the in the in their astronomical alignments and the sort of stones they used and no one really knows why but there is there there are these links there and there is this old understanding and knowledge that span not only isolated areas, but almost created this network across continents and across whole, um, almost the whole world. Yeah, and when you go to the UK with that view of understanding their megalithic culture and what was happening there, you see, well, 70% of Europe's megalithic sites are located in Ireland. I never knew that before. I went and started looking into this and you see these huge structures, you know, Newgrange and um, there's, they're all over Ireland and they have these same amazing alignments to uh, that they measured the, the cycle of Venus, they measured the solstice. If you go there on that day, same as Stonehenge, there is an alignment where the sun shines straight down the um, structure of New, Newgrange. It's remarkable, really. And it's this same knowledge, isn't it? It's this same understanding and then all of a sudden you're starting to see this pattern. You see the huge um, standing stone sites across France like, and it, it, it's similar concepts to the UK, yet there's no... And we can just write that off as oh, you know, ancients putting silly stones up. But when you look at it in that context, it doesn't really make sense, does it? Yeah, and I think that's, that's one of the really interesting things, that there, there, there are these flashes of, of um, knowledge that are popping, popping up and um, resurfacing. And I mean, a lot of the modern um, pioneers of science and physics that have come up with these ideas that are sort of mind-blowing and takes a long time to be accepted as scientific theories. But a lot of these people have studied ancient pr- practices and, and have like really looked into the old cultures and, and what they knew and adopted that to further our modern science. But a lot of it comes from a basis from ancient that, that the ancients seem to understand or seem to at least talk about. Um, and these are the, some of the most influential people on our society today. We're talking about people like Isaac Newton, who wrote the principles of Mathematica, which in the 1600s became the basis of what we learn in schools today. And so, you know, with Newton, you know, he, he was known to be this, quite this reclusive, strange guy that would spend a lot of time on his own. Um, but what he would do is he would ref- basically break down, um, do experiments on light, and he understood the electromagnetic spectrum, which was not understood then. Um, and he would also sun gaze, for instance. And his equations and mathematical principles all came from this understanding light. But what happened was that in the 30s, it was found that he was a big proponent of alchemy which is a very strange link and you might go what you know what does that have to do with anything but alchemy has its roots in ancient egypt and so there is an idea that newton was pinned to this uh ancient knowledge that came out of egypt and that you can follow that line from egypt to the greeks which is what our modern society is built on plato all of those things 
today. You know, Plato writes the basis of our political system, of our religion, of our、um, ethics system. We use all that today, yet we don't try and find where Plato found his references from. And something you never do in the scientific community is you take an idea without referencing it. So. And I think, as well, it's dangerous to use ideas without knowing where they came from, because without knowing their full context, you don't know exactly what they do. Yeah, and and with、um, with Plato and a lot of the ancient Greek philosophers, they would spend a lot of time in Egypt, learning from the Egyptian priests, because Egypt was seen in ancient times as this like this area of high knowledge, and where all of this ancient, all these ancient practices sort of culminated. So the Greeks would go learn. And return to Greece with this insight, and Plato was a descendant of that sort of legacy. But then, what I've found really interesting with Egypt is looking at where they got the knowledge that they had, because they, you know, they we still can't produce the pyramids today, or if we could, it would cost billions. And who would who would take that on? Because it would probably take a whole lifetime to build. The pyramids、um, of Giza are just. When you look at them in that context, and after we went to Stonehenge, that kind of really changed my lens on how I looked at these structures. And it is just out of this world what they produce there. And, you know, the 2.5 million blocks, or and the is it 200 ton stones lifted up in the middle, like and aligned to potentially astro. There's archaeoastronomy there that it's aligned to the cardinal alignments of the planets. It is. Just mind blowing, and you know we couldn't do it today. You know that's that comes from an engineer's perspective. There's no way. The other thing you have to ask is why would they do that? Why would they lock a pyramid to true north, and why would they go to so much trouble to build a structure that is, you know, so accurate and so,、um, you know, so aligned to the. To the principles, what, the, what they talk about, for instance, of nature, and then you see the same things at, at Stonehenge, don't you? Like, for instance, alignments to solstices,、um, equinoxes, and that there seems to be this knowledge that they're encoding into it that we don't really have a, a grip on today. Yeah, definitely. And the the pyramids are one of countless examples in Egypt of this insanely high knowledge and and. This this skill and this、um, almost obsession with perfecting and building in in line with these sacred principles that they had with numbers and、um, and you know the solar system and the stars and having having their their culture and their civilization built to fit in with these old ideas and these and that they are part of something bigger. They're part of the solar system. They're part of the galaxy.、Um, and I remember reading a book by.、Uh, I don't think I can pronounce his name. Schwalad Lubitz,、um, who wrote the Temple of Man, which was a、uh, a book about this temple in Luxor, which seems to encode all of the scientific knowledge that they had, all of the mathematical knowledge they had. It's just got insane depth to it. Yeah, that was a real breakthrough. Like when I saw that, and when you look at what he paints out is encoded into the Temple of Luxor, you're talking about. Deep mathematical principles, and he talks about how the Egyptians, in their language, in the hieroglyph system, that binary math is built into how they speak and how they think. And then we understand today that binary math is the, the base, the basis of computing and coding. It's crazy. You, you, just just that point, thinking that they're, they're, they were teaching their kids computer code, like. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense for us because we're so far removed from that. But to them, it was so simple, and that having that understanding, I think, is how that they were able to build these perfect structures and harmonious buildings and things that really. You look at them, and it's like music cast in stone. Like they're so they're so proportional to each other, and it's just this understanding of these basic principles of mathematics that taught from a young age. And Schroller was really he was a deep. Scholar of both anthropolog- anthropological science, but also this idea of esoteric knowledge and this this Egyptian body of knowledge that he was trying to show had this deep scientific basis too. So he spent what、well, was nearly ten years at the Temple of Luxor with the French army and with the disposal of a rich wife that he could,、um, you know, basically research and. Bring out these amazing books, like you—they're so thick, it's unbelievable.、Mm. But 
and it's so dense the knowledge he brings out, but he shows the temple basically follows the growth of, for instance, the phylalactic growth of a young uh, pharaoh, and so that how the body grows and how these principles in nature of human growth is related to how a plant grows in nature. And we know that happens. There are mathematical principles in the Fibonacci um, numbers and the, uh, the golden ratio and how flowers, for instance, uh, span out in a set of numbers. And the same thing happens in biological creatures. For instance, a face has a set of proportions and golden proportions where we find certain things attractive. And that tells us things about the genetic information about the person. And when you see someone with good genetic information, you find that attractive and that that becomes a, a standpoint for wanting to mate and pass on genetic information. And that's all nature just doing this amazing process. And they seem to understand that that's what, the Temple of Man really kind of brings out is that there was this whole body of knowledge there. And also, not only t- the binary math- mathematics, but also an understanding of the physiology of the human body. They've got detailed drawings of the eye and every single aspect of the eye and all the nerve endings. The eight and nerves, all- yeah. So the, col- the columns in the, t- in the head, there's eight columns there to represent the the nerve endings. It's unbelievable. And even, even detailed descriptions of the pineal gland and and things that we're only catching up to now in, in modern science, they had a f- very advanced knowledge of. Yeah, and the, it's, it's yeah, it's it's fascinating. The most sacred temple in the, or room in the Temple of Luxor is where the priests would go, is where you can phylalactically, biologically place. So for instance, when you walk in, it's, it's the feet of the, um, of the Pharaoh. And it goes through time as well. There's all, all the different pharaohs contributed to the Temple of Luxor. But then the, the most sacred room, you can then relate to the to the pineal gland, which is the center point of the brain. And we're now, there's no explanation as to what the pineal gland does today. You know, health professionals don't get that. And, but there's a big body of scientific knowledge that shows us that how crucial the pineal gland is to everything. And it's they seem to think it was crucial. You know, we're now just discovering that it's crucial, yet we've missed where all this whole idea came from and it it really shows how you can completely be no- knocked off where you came from if you just don't understand where the problems come from and the Greeks really followed the Egyptians um, and that's really where these ideas kind of let out and got really somewhat um, diluted into the Romans into the into where we are today and when you follow that line it just it you can see how you lose these things and we're in a, a little bit of a collective state of amnesia, aren't we, where we forgot where we came from. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, yeah, you learn in, in school, you know, oh, yeah, we, this is a maths equation and we, we learned that from the Greeks. And it's sort of, it's sort of the, you just accept it and you kind of think, all right, yeah, the Greeks, the Greeks knew maths. Um, well, okay. they, d- they discovered maths. They discovered maths, yeah. yeah. Um, but then the, the more you look into almost every aspect of science, and physics and you know astronomy it's it all ties back and back and back and back and the interesting thing about egypt is they had this huge body of knowledge but they themselves said that their civilization was a legacy handed down to them which is interesting because when they when the when dynastic egypt first appears in the archaeological record the language is fully formed the hieroglyphic system is fully formed which doesn't really make that much sense you'd think that it would de- be a development into what they were but it was almost as if it started as this perfect system that slowly degraded over time and you can see that in the in the structures they built the oldest pyramids are, are often the most beautiful and the most perfectly aligned and still in the best condition today compared to the ones that were built later and as this knowledge was sort of dying off or being forgotten yeah the cycles of egyptian culture is known now and the other thing that really kind of spruiked my my interest into how much we don't know about egyptian culture for instance if that was the foundation of where our modern knowledge comes from today so we know for instance that the foundations of modern computing was known in egypt like that's known yet we've not attributed that if you think about the archaeological record that we've we've uncovered in egypt we've barely scrape the surface barely 10 percent of what we know today is what lies under egypt and so there's all this history there that 
we're probably just scraping the surface. And if you think of the iceberg model, you know, looking at the iceberg from the top where 80% of the iceberg lies under the water, you can't get a grip of what the whole structure is about unless you see where, you know, how it's floating and all of its structure that's causing its buoyancy underneath the underneath the water. And we've had these little snippets come out and we're just lost from the point of origin really. And even in some of the most most critical aspects of our life today, for instance, electricity, like where does that come from? Well, Nikola Tesla was really the one that brought the use of AC current and that was via understanding of what he would call principles of Vedic physics and uh, understanding how energy works. And this is the same things that, that people like Albert Einstein was tapping into. And we don't really attribute Tesla so much as being so crucial. It was more... Um, it was more Th- Thomas Edison, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. But Tesla, Tesla lived his life by these old principles. He used to do these bizarre things like turn a light switch on and off three times or walk around a block three times before he entered a building because it all linked into these ancient numbers that he was so sure were the building blocks of all knowledge. So if you tapped into that and you lived your life by these principles, then you could gain access and insights to these really advanced scientific principles that maybe you wouldn't if you weren't in tune with the ideas. And um, I think I think all these little snippets of information were the inspiration to, for us anyway, with Human Origin Project, to start sort of categorising the pieces of information that we had in building pillars where that we could draw um, research and draw ideas into and sort of start putting together a picture and a, and a big and a story um, so I guess yeah looking at these these old science scientists and these old ideas well I never knew for instance that AC current could be attributed attributed to Tesla who was a scholar of or well, someone that was very interested in you know the Vedic text so like that to me is a big missing, you know, for me, I want to understand what the Vedas, uh, you know, tell us if, if that's where, what Tesla could do with that information. And then, so, and th- there's lots of these breakthrough people, like for instance, Einstein, he had his big breakthrough in 1905. He published, what, four to five papers in that time that... That changed the world, that ended the war, changed the world. We, it's still, I mean, Einstein, Einstein is the the man to talk talk about well he's probably the most well-known scientist today and so what we attributed him to and his breakthrough he was a nothing and then all of a sudden in 1905 he downloaded this well he came up with this information about um you know the four papers to do with uh the molecular basis of um of atoms which we'd never thought about um relativity that was a whole breakthrough that he would end up well, he, he won multiple Nobel Prizes, but there were a few papers that he just, you don't just publish breakthrough papers like that out of nowhere, right? And we attribute that as, as the discovery. But if you think about it, you know, it seems like he was tapping into these principles. Yeah, definitely. And that there are still instances of this high knowledge today in old cultures that are still living. I mean, there's there's a, the example of the Dogon tribe in, in North Africa who seem to know things about science and astronomy that that they shouldn't know, you know, without modern telescopes. Um, you know, things like the orbit, the orbital periods of certain planets, and the uh, when certain constellations rise and fall, and when um, and and not only that, but also an understanding that, an understanding of what atoms are, and understanding about waves and protons and particles, and all these these ridiculously advanced things that you don't think a primitive tribe should know but they know about it and they they even talk about things that precede modern science so there are these there is still this there is still this knowledge being preserved in some cultures and um it's really it's really a lifelong it has to be almost an obsession to start looking at it all and trying to work out well what where did they understand where did they get what they know and how do they how does that how does it even work you know yeah the Dogen is such a great example because what some people have found is and you know they, they were studied extensively through the 20th century by anthropologists and what people found is that they have this deep culture of 
priesthood that would hold this body of knowledge that they would allow people to kind of level up in it and learn and understand. And what they found was that these principles um, talked about astronomical um, bodies. So, for instance, Sirius has is a binary star system that has a second, and they used to talk about the two is it the sisters, isn't it? Yeah, there's a, there's a story in, in ancient Egypt about Isis. Um, well, so we should probably before we go to Egypt, there's a, there's a story in in, in the Dogen um, where we have the, the the two gods have has sisters, and what they're referring to is the star system Sirius as having a a second star. And what Carl Sagan and uh, 20th century astronomers discounted that to as uh, Jewish missionaries teaching them that and telling them there was a second star. But what has now been shown is that their myth goes far, di- we call it myths, I don't like that word because it completely discounts, it's just knowledge, it's science. And so what they found is that their creation stories and their um their knowledge, their priesthood knowledge, actually takes you through the fundamental uh, mechanics of light, of, of atoms, of the orbital periods of Sirius, stuff that they, you know, goes far beyond just knowing, you know, missionaries can't just tell them that. And so the silly idea that we um, just discount it as this fluffy little story they would tell their children really does take away what, what they're really trying to tell us. And, yeah. and the, the anthropologists that studied them, that we have almost all the information about um, the Dogon through these studies. It took them over 30 years of living with the Dogon up to the point that they got, when, they, when the researchers passed away, they got given a Dogon burial at, and they were in, initiated as part of the tribe. Um, but it took them that long to get, to be trusted and to be, given access to all this information. So people have gone, um, I think he's, there was a Dutch researcher, Van Beek, who went to try and show that, um, to try and re- recreate this study that went on. And he only lasted a few years and he couldn't find any examples of this, um, he couldn't find any examples of this esoteric tradition that the Dogon had in this high knowledge. So, but it kind of is counterintuitive because you're not going to find out this secret knowledge in a few years like it's a lifetime and that's kind of what we've discovered it's kind of like this is going to be a lifelong obsession to try and understand and work out this this story absolutely and that really goes back to einstein's story that you know he had this big breakthrough in 1905 but he spent his whole life trying to understand the things that he unearthed in 1905 from joining special and general relativity to quantum mechanics and so one of the papers that he published in 1905 which he would win a Nobel Prize for was that uh, matter you know travels in as a photon as as energy and then so what that unearthed later in the 20th century was this whole world of quantum mechanics and what he found was that the principles Newtonian physical principles physics um, the mathematical principles of the world we see the planets and so forth don't apply when we go to this very small scale and he could never reconcile this and I think the problem is potentially that when you don't really kind of pull in the full context and when you think of like the Dogon, for instance, they talk about these very, very small particles and they also talk about astronomical bodies as well. So they actually had this full system and that when we look at it in this bond sense, we lose that anchoring to why we're doing this. Because we, we've become so specialised, haven't we? In, in Someone can study their whole life looking at Going back to talking about medicine, studying the teeth, they know they they could be the the most knowledgeable person on teeth, but they might not understand the mechanism that makes teeth crooked. They might not understand how teeth are meant to develop or what happens before you have teeth. And if you apply that to this world of um, ancient cultures and knowledge and physics and consciousness and all these things that the Human Origin Project we're, we're talking about, I think it's so important to to be to to understand the whole picture is to have the whole picture and to look at it, to take a step back and look at the whole body and not, not get too carried away with the very precise details. Yeah, completely. And that's a problem I think that Einstein got stuck in is he was trying to reconcile his equations to uh, to reconcile uh, quantum mechanics and, and Newtonian physics and he couldn't do it. And the problem was he got stuck in that he couldn't pull himself out of that context. 
And, you know, those kind of problems have happened right throughout history as well. When you have these breakthrough discoveries and it comes out in a snippet, you know, when you think of, for instance, um, the the story of evolution, Dar- Darwinian natural selection and the origin of species, uh, you know, Darwin was someone that, you know, he was a, a naturalist, but he basically just went around the world, just understood a lot of different biological systems. And he wrote this, these principles by which biological systems advance forward. And when it was done, there was no knowledge of what DNA, what it does in the body, what it is in the body. Um, and there wasn't even a knowledge of her, um, biologic, biological um, hereditary so the, that you can inherit things from parents we didn't understand we understood the principles but we didn't understand exactly the laws of it and that was Mendel's work before who was discounted and so one thing that does happen in this whole area is that people get stuck in one little principle and they say well there's no evidence for that well people like Mendel people like Darwin met a lot of resistance to these ideas because we're trying to put them into a box into a context that doesn't fit into the whole scenario and it's so it's so hard to change someone's mind if you've got it if you've got your mind set on something or you've got an idea changing that perspective is so difficult and it takes a lot of time and you know even people like Galileo and um you know these these people that were ahead of their time met so much resistance and you know you couldn't even talk about earth not being at the center of the the solar system but now it's it's taught in schools like it's completely normal well, Cop- Copernicus but- wrote about it but was too afraid to publish it because he knew he'd be lynched for it (laughs) yeah exactly so i I feel like there is a there is a bit of a shift happening um at the moment with our perspective on things and that a lot of the things we know and that we talk about are missing slight there's a there's a piece of the puzzle slightly missing um and it's just it's just changing the framework and, and understanding the context and i feel like that's that's been a really exciting thing about human origin project is that we can have a platform where we start changing our perspective and start understanding the context through through this wide range of information um and you know talking to people that are doing research in really interesting fields that might not have the um the option to to speak to a large audience you know and we we are trying to have a space to bring people together to talk about these ideas and to you know learn and just keep keep teaching and keep researching and understanding and recalibrating that really sacred knowledge into one direct because one thing i found too is that all of this information comes back to a very a very simple and very pure source that you know seemed to guide all of these ancient cultures and you know whatever happened you know however these great minds made these breakthroughs some these principles were guiding their breakthroughs when you think about the copernican revolution you know the idea that the earth for instance is the center of the universe completely changes your mindset doesn't it you know that completely locks you into the idea that you know everything that happens in your daily life is the most important thing on the planet or in the in the universe but then when you understand there is a universe and that our planet revolves around sun that's a whole awakening isn't it and you know at the time when galileo published that he was persecuted for that and it was took a long time for the church to really acknowledge that the earth was a body moving around the sun and we're now in the situation where there's a lot of scientific principles kind of sitting there waiting to be acknowledged like that that we're just ignoring because we're stuck in an old system and every single one of these great innovators newton tesla einstein to a certain extent um galileo and copernicus certainly darwin they were all absolutely um, they were completely, their ideas were nearly shot down because, and people like Mendel never never lived to see the recognition of their work. And so we do get stuck in these systems because we don't step back and look at the, the bigger picture. But I think overall, you know, we've covered, you know, why do you think that we, we've forgotten this all? You know, like the, when you look at, the concept of uh, amnesia you know there's a lot of different medical uh cases where, for instance where you see people block out memories or they forget things physiologically for many different ways so there's it's interesting to kind of think of humans as a species with amnesia and people have written about that but when you look at these little lines of 
what we use today and what we understand about the world, it does seem that we are in some state of amnesia, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't. We we live we live day to day with these. The like, you walk over and turn on a light bulb, um, but you don't understand where. You know, you, you start looking into that. You don't really understand where that originated from, and that that it's that happens everywhere. You know, our our, our whole world is built on these fundamental principles that we don't really understand where they originated. And I think once you start to understand them, once you start looking into where they originated, it everything just clicks into gear a bit bit better. And I feel like it's a, a mixture of understanding that and, and understanding, uh, you know, these ancient cultures and these ancient civilizations and understanding where we fit into that, where our consciousness sits. All these little things help to put together this coherent sort of idea of us and where we're going and remembering you know the things that we might have lost it does feel somewhat remember like all the research i've been i've looked at over the last few years i look at it and it makes so much sense once you understand it in that context it does feel like a remembering process which is really interesting um yeah it's like when you wake up and you don't really remember a dream and it starts kind of coming back and then you get another little hit of information and you you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. And, yeah, I, I feel like I know what you mean. It's like uh, it's like it's just these little flashes that you can kind of hold on to and keep building on and, and understanding. Well, the concept of deja vu, for instance, that feeling that you've been somewhere before or, yeah, it's... But I feel that everyone's kind of following that that instinct that where there is something there that we're trying to remember and that that's why these things resonate with people so much and that's why... For instance, there's been we've found such a big community around the world looking at these things, and yeah, I, I'm just really excited. You always, when you find someone that has done great research in these kind of areas, that you can see that it's profoundly affected their life and that it, it embodies them. And the, capturing those moments and finding those people that have done that good work has really been, I, I think, one of the most rewarding parts of this because. One, I understand the process that they go through because, you know, the love that has to go into a, you know, the, finding the pure research that isn't miscued in a way where there's mistakes or to, to keep it correct, but also in a way that it's communicated for good. You know, ultimately, you know, a lot of this information, you know, when you think of the Einstein um, example, you know, he used his knowledge to stop well, one, there was the the use of nuclear weapons, which you could say potentially questionable. Um, but you know, was that a use of um, to stop a a force that was miscued? Maybe it's really interesting when you start to see, you know, how can we realign all this information and can we use it for good? All right, man. So I think that was a pretty good first episode. So uh, one of the really important things I think we've found to set out with people that ask about the Human Origin Project is, you know, what's it all about? And really this, what we've gone through is what it's meant to be. It's meant to crack open that that shell that, you're, that you've been stuck in, for, for instance, and start to look at things with a, with a much wider lens and, you know, just be curious. And ultimately that's what we are, right? You know, we're just um, you know, two curious guys that really enjoy ancient cultures and 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 research really and sticking our heads into strange books <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely and i think having a space where you can have these conversations and you know i i know for me i love talking about these topics and i find it tough to talk about other things because it, it feels like there's no there's no real meaning or depth to it um so it's nice having a space where we can talk we can share ideas and and expand on old knowledge or expand on new scientific knowledge or and just bring it all together and and help each other understand what, you know, what, it, what it's all about. Great. Yeah, so next week, why don't we have um, episode two talking about the different um, categories of hop and the, the scientific fields that we're covering and so forth. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and The Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter 
or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.